So first I have good news. It's written that if a community of 150 all do a mitzvah together, each member of the community doesn't get credit for one mitzvah. It's a communal mitzvah. So everybody here gets 150 credits if you do a mitzvah together like study Torah, study the law. When you turn in your package today, you get 600 credits. <laughs> so when you give it to, you have a lifetime or two lifetimes of credits applying halachic laws we're required to do today. So when you turn this in, make sure you get the whole 600 credits. It's my honor and privilege to introduce these two titans, Shane Inspector and Michael Smirkanish. As to Shane Inspector, we lawyers, we have healthy egos, correct? So whenever you think your ego is getting a little bit out of hand, here's what you do. Go to the Client Inspector website. Punch in Shane Inspector's credentials. Browse it. Look at his credentials. I assure you, it'll keep you on an even keel. You know, the dictionary has a specific definition for Philadelphia lawyer. And it's, quote, a very shrewd lawyer who is expert at exploitation of legal technicalities. So a Philadelphia lawyer, folks, is the gold standard of lawyers. Shane Inspector is the gold standard of Philadelphia lawyers. In his capacity as litigator at the firm of Klein Inspector, Shannon has become well familiar with issues surrounding ethics and the media. And we're most appreciative to have him here with us today. First and foremost, he's a Philly guy, and he's a mensch. While the myriad of multi-million dollar verdicts and settlements, along with the myriad of the tens of millions of dollars in separate settlements is staggering, it is not monetary compensation that sets him apart. It is the social change for the better that he has accomplished and effectuated. Shannon's work has benefited society at large and mass enhancing public safety throughout the medical field, enhancing the safe operation of police vehicles, the safe use of CPR at all public institutions, easing safety concerns involving our utility companies, affecting us all, and I can go on and on. An alumnus of Penn Charter, do we have any Penn Charter folks here? Oh, okay. They're outside. And also of the University of Pennsylvania, he is Philly through and through. His dear father, of course, the Senator Arl Inspector, may he rest in peace, proudly served our country and our community as United States Senator, Chief District Attorney, and like his father, Arlen, Shane and too is a devoted family man. I can honestly say that when I traveled to Barnegat Light and Sunday mornings, they had mustache bills in Barnegat. I could be with my family and I would see Arlen with his grandkids, a regular pop pop. And one half hour later, we took a stroll back to the house and Arlen was on Meet the Press live talking about effectuating Middle East peace. It's amazing. I would be remiss to omit one of Shannon's most unique accomplishments. He is an avid player of squash. Any squash players here? All right, those are the ones that went to pinch order. <laughs> He's excelled both locally, ask anyone at the Philadelphia Cricket Club, and internationally at the Maccabi Games in Israel. A well-rounded individual, Let's give some love to Shane Inspector. <laughs> Introducing Michael Smirconish on key. Off the record, my vote for President of the United States for 2020. <laughs> Honestly, as a matter of fact, a Smirconish Specter ticket wouldn't, an independent ticket wouldn't be so bad. So what 
We're all pretty smart here. What do these people have in common? Madonna, Prince, Sting, Spider-Man, Smirkanish. One name says it all. <laughs> Saturday morning during Minion, 9 a.m., CNN airs a wonderful television show titled Smirkanish, hosted by our guest to my right, Michael Smirkanish. Again, Smirkanish, one name says it all. Oh, by the way, thank God, even the most observant individual can watch Smirkanish's Sunday, Saturday morning show. I say thank God, not God. Thank God. Comcast on demand. <laughs> you press the record button once, every Smirkanish episode is taped. You can watch it any time of the week, except on Yom Kippur and on Shabbat at 9 a.m. <laughs> Michael Smirkanish also hosts his wildly popular regular w weekday morning show on Sirius XM Satellite Radio. Now more than ever, Media and politics are inextricably intertwined. This is the world that we live with today and live through, and this is the world that Mr. Smirkanish must navigate each and every day. When I grew up, there was Huntley and Brinkley. There was Walter Cronkite. It was like our grandfathers. Their word was their bond. Times have changed. Michael earned his undergraduate degree at Lehigh, obtained his law degree at Penn. Although a lawyer by trade, Mr. McConish has become a celebrated author and journalist. He's authored seven books, two of which achieved New York Times bestseller list, and he goes on tour in 2020, so keep an eye out and check it out. For well more than a decade, Mr. Smirkanish has been considered one of the most prolific talk show hosts in the United States, focusing for most of those 10 years on radio. Mr. Smirkanish has been given the opportunity to be the first interview of presidents when they come into the White House. And he's the first one that interviews the presidents in the White House. It's the first opportunity. While the media in America has generally become polarized, offering a far liberal left or far conservative right point of view, Smirkanish offers a refreshing, impartial, centrist position. While the media talking heads not infrequently hurl what we call lush and horror, invectives, slurs, Smirkanish refrains from such name calling. His approach is akin to a referee. He merely reports what he sees, and if he sees a foul, he doesn't call foul. It's up to you, the viewer, to call foul. I'm very proud to introduce Michael Smirkanish. Well, thank you very much, Simon, for those very generous uh, and somewhat inflated introductory remarks <laughs> about myself and about Michael. Since this is a program on ethics, we feel constrained to, <laughs> to, be, to be truthful at all times, uh, uh, or at least we're going to say so. Uh, the way that we're going to proceed is that I'm going to interview Michael for the better part of an hour. I'll pause before the hour is over and invite your questions of Michael. And then Michael will interview me for the better part of an hour and also pause and invite your questions. So Michael, we've heard a little bit about your background. Uh, you are both a journalist and a lawyer. For the benefit uh, of the audience, would you give us a little more detail as to how you got into both areas of work. So, and good afternoon everyone, thank you for having me. Uh, I've spent my entire life in a 50 mile radius. I was born and raised in Doylestown. I then attended the Central Bucks Public Schools K through 12, did go to Lehigh University, uh, not ashamed to say as a legacy because my brother was four years ahead of me and my father had obtained a master's from Lehigh, otherwise I'm not sure they would have wanted me. Uh, but I had a professor who lit uh, an academic and intellectual flame in me while I was at Lehigh 
That's what enabled me to go to Penn for law school. And along the way, while I was still in school, I had these very unique political experiences. I turned 18 in the spring of 1980, and that was my senior year. My father, who had been a guidance counselor, and before that, a school teacher in those same Bucks County, uh, Central Bucks schools, decided he'd been active in his community, but never politically active per se. And there was an open seat in the Pennsylvania State Legislature in the spring of my senior year, and my father decided to run for it. And I was completely enthused, full of something in vinegar for politics by virtue of my dad's experience running for that state legislative seat. He was unsuccessful, but I thought I knew for the first time something about what I wanted to do in the future. And so I graduated from high school, I went off to Lehigh University, and, and by now, Ronald Reagan and George Herbert Walker Bush, Pop Bush, were united uh, on the Republican ticket. Our household was a Republican household. There was not a question as to whether initially I would be an R or a D. I was going to be an R and, and follow, at least in the short term, my parents in their footsteps. So I, I arrived on campus. Not all my answers are going to be this lengthy, but this is my favorite question. So <laughs> I, I arrived on campus all enthused about politics in general, that ticket in particular, and mistakenly thinking that my classmates shared my enthusiasm for politics, which they didn't. So uh, I devised a, uh, uh, an idea. My idea was to bring the multitude of Reagan Bush supporters out of their dorm rooms, I would throw a kegger. <laughs> the kegger that I threw was on a particular Wednesday night in October of 1980. Shannon could probably figure out the date. We're talking Phillies, Royals, World Series, Steve Carlton pitching, a 10-inning game, a 4-3 Phillies loss, and nobody came to the kegger. <laughs> now, I know when I say that, you think it's a, a manner of speech that maybe five people came or 20 people came, but no one came. And I ended up having to take with a hand cart three half kegs of beer back to the freshman dormitory and letting all the guys who were watching the game drink the beer, which is probably what I should have been doing that night as well. I tell you that story because now you'll understand why when a few days after the kegger that went bust, Someone yelled down the hall, 150 guys, one hall phone, no internet, no cell phone, that I was wanted on the phone by George Bush's office. <laughs> Thinking of the keg party, I thought I was getting pranked. But in fact, someone on the staff of Ambassador George Bush, that was his then title, in view of the fact that he had been UN ambassador, someone had learned of my quote unquote club on the Lehigh University campus, and they desperately needed, if you can believe this in a pre 9 11 world, motorcade drivers for the cars of the future vice president who was making an 11th hour tour of the Bethlehem Steel plant. And so I hung up after asking, could we drive the motorcade cars, and knocked on the door of liberal, communist, independent, Republican, <laughs> and I said, who wants to meet George Bush? This time, I got enough takers. The future vice president and president came to Bethlehem Steel. We worked on the visit, and when it ended, I was recruited to be an advance man for George Bush. And that was the start of a number of unique political experiences that caused me to somehow want to be involved in this, whatever this is. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, Mike, at some point along the line, you went to law school. Right. Is that right? <laughs> that too, yes. And tell us, tell us for, for how long you practiced law and whether you still practice law. So I, I was very proud to get into Penn. I worked, I worked awfully hard to be accepted to Penn. But while I was there, my attention was very much on the politics, at least beyond the, the first year. And so uh, in the second year, that same state legislative seat that my father had run unsuccessfully for six years prior was now vacant. The individual who'd won the seat had moved on to the state Senate. And, and I decided that I would run and vindicate my father's loss. 
And so in 1986, I ran in a Republican primary. It was the type of district where if you won the primary GOP side of the aisle, you were going to win the general. I ran thinking that this was, you know, the culmination of the American dream. Dad lost. I'll win. I lost by 419 votes. I have since located 236 of those people. <laughs> um, and, and then I, uh, I worked for Shannon's father. Uh, because he was now running for re-election in 1986, and it was really the, the start of a, of a wonderful relationship that I enjoyed with Senator Specter. Uh, 1987, I was involved with Frank Rizzo in what was the, he was now a Republican, and it was Rizzo Good, the rematch. And when all of that was over and I had graduated, I, I was not prepared to practice law. So I went into the real estate business with my brother. Uh, we made money and lost a fortune. And then George Bush was now the president of the United States. And I was appointed with the blessing of Senator Specter to a sub-cabinet level position where I was responsible, some of you may remember this, for all federal housing in five states, uh, Pennsylvania among them, and Washington, D.C. And, uh, and I served in the administration until Bill Clinton defeated George Bush, and now I had to uh, do something different. And that's when I began to practice law. Did so for a decade with James E. Beasley, and today don't practice on a day-to-day -day basis, but I'm proud to be associated with Klein Inspector. Mm -hmm. I've known Shannon for many, many years. Uh, we, we, we met when uh, both of our families had Eagle season tickets in the end zone. We were in the 600 level. He was in the 500 level. Uh, true story. He's always had better seats than I have. It continues till today. Uh, but it's been a long, long friendship, and I've known uh, uh, Tom for a long time as well. Hey, that's correct. And Tom Klein is in the house. Tom Klein, please stand. So, Mike... Uh, <laughs> Folks, I think of you here, I think it's a journalist. But, you, but we've been going now for uh, 10 minutes, and we haven't heard anything about journalism. So what happened with all that? So uh, because I'd, I'd had these unique political experiences, I was, I was asked by some of the Philadelphia Network affiliates, and, and really my mentor from a television standpoint was Larry Kane. And it was Larry who, in I, I, another quick digression, if I might, when I was growing up in Doylestown, one of my summer jobs was to deliver pool and patio furniture for, for a, a, a business called Mountain Lake Pool and Patio. And one day I was told that I was handed a, literally a three by five card that had an address in Rydal. And it said, Larry Kane needs chlorine and you know pH rise or something for the pool. And and that was really a big deal. That was like a plum assignment to go to Larry Kane's house in Rydal with a bucket of chlorine. <laughs> so with the, the owner's son together in a small panel truck, we set off from Doylestown to Rydal. And we're disappointed when someone working in a domestic capacity and answered the door and said, you can just put the chlorine out back by the pool. Oh, no, no, no. We were not going to be so easily sent away. We said, Mr. Kane needs to sign the bill of lading. <laughs> Listen, to this, to this day, I have no idea what a bill of lading might be. But... He fell for it because Larry now shows up. And it, it, it occurs to me in retrospect, he was probably doing the late news, you know, and had been up late and then got to, and here we are, these two punks on his doorstep. He came down with no shirt and his fly down and a pair of shorts, <laughs> just wanting to know, where can I sign? And before he knew what had hit him, the two kids from Doylestown pull out one of those cameras where you push the button and it would spit out the picture and you'd have to shake it for 10 seconds. And we each put our arm around him and have a picture taken with Larry Kane. That was my first meeting with Larry. But years later, it would be Larry, by virtue of these political experiences, who would invite me to be one of the, the, the local network pundits. And from that came an invitation from WWDB, the talk station, uh, which was a 50,000 watt flamethrower and the only talk station in town. Chuck and Susan Schwartz owned it at the time. They were the last of the sort of independent owners. And they put me on air to provide election commentary. And I, I think the ego of it consumed me. 
And at some point, I also decided that I had a skill set for it, and this is what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And when about did you have your first show? So my my first program, I, I began, I want to say, in 1991. I think you were among my first guests. Where I, I they they would first they would bring me on as a, a guest, and then I was a guest host, literally given uh, Super Bowl Sunday, Thanksgiving night, and and you know those type of uh, of, of slots. If you looked at it on a graph in terms of where I began and then where I, I ended in terms of time slots, you know it would make logical sense, but of course, it's just the way life, you know, what does John Lennon say? Life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. It's not as if there was a plan or a scheme to it. It just evolved. Mm -hmm. Uh, If I may add to that, in 1991, Michael did have his first show on uh, WWDB, (laughs) and it was on the mayor's race because there was a a hotly uh, and fiercely tested mayoral primary, and Michael was talking about that very important and interesting topic, and he had no callers, I think because there were probably close to no listeners. And uh, Michael was scrambling, and uh, I could tell he had no callers, so I, I believe I was his first caller. Uh, or, or if not, I was close to his first caller. Under an alias that I'm sure he'll reveal, given that this is an ethics seminar. Yes. <laughs> yes, I, I was Jack from Haverford, and that's because, that's because our dog's name was Jack. True story. And it, it wouldn't have been very good if I had used my, my real name. We're, we're having a sort of, this is sort of a, a passing association with ethics here. We've told at least five stories in which we've lied repetitively. <laughs> So, well, now we're telling the truth, but, but the underlying stories are lies. Uh, but none of it involves practicing law. And so let's talk a little bit, if we could, about journalism and ethics. And Mike, and this is, this is obviously now a serious question. You come to journalism starting in 1991, you're an attorney at that point in time. You haven't done much by way of practice. But uh, in the intervening 28 years, uh, you, you've seen a lot, both in law and in, and in journalism. And, and what do you see with respect to journalistic ethics, if that's not an oxymoron? Well, the journalism, I don't know that the legal landscape, from my perspective, has changed all that much. If it has, it certainly has not changed as much as the media landscape. When I began in the late 80s, early 90s as a talk radio host on WWDB, I think about the lineup of that station, and you'll remember some of these names. Uh, Dominic Quinn, DQ, was a conservative. But frankly, he was best known for his command of the English language. We would do a charity spelling bee every year and just stand by and let him answer the questions because he was brilliant and had such a command of the language. Irv Homer. You remember Irv. Irv was a libertarian before any of us knew what that meant, you know, much less having met Ron or uh, Rand Paul. Susan Bray had a husky voice. She was from Australia. She was the saucy Aussie. Frank Ford was married to Lynn Abraham. Frank was a doctrinaire liberal who was on that station. And then the person I think about most often is Bernie Herman, who would do 10 to 1. And do you remember what Bernie's shtick or brand was? He was the gentlemen of broadcasting. And the, the, the commonality of those hosts is that they were conversationalists. And all you were expected to do when you hosted a program in that era was make the phone ring. Everything changed. And it changed when a talk radio host from Sacramento who was having great success was syndicated. And this happened in that same time period, 1991, Rush Limbaugh. And AM radio was really on its last legs then because FM and music had commanded all of the advertising dollars. And overnight, stations wanted to have Limbaugh or one of his imitators because I would argue that he was right in saying that the media then, which did not include cable, did not include satellite radio, really was controlled by just a handful of outlets, was a left of center place. So he filled that void. And so, too, then, did all of the imitators put on stations around the country. Fox News came online. MSNBC came online. Here came the Internet. And I'm giving you, the, believe it or not, the short version of how we ended up over the span of the 30 years that I've been involved with this incredibly polarized landscape. 
And that has all been, to answer your question, to the detriment, I think, of honesty and of ethics, um, because now it's become an entertainment industry. And too many people are unable to distinguish between the journalists and the entertainers, the people who are there to deliver news versus the people who are there to attract mouse clicks and eyes to websites and ears to their radio programs and, and book sales and so forth. It's become a whole cottage industry to be outraged. And I do a presentation around the country talking about, you know, how did we get where we are? And I, I, I lay out a whole variety of factors, but at the top of my list, which may sound odd for someone who earns his keep behind a microphone, is I blame the media. And I think it's been hugely destructive to the country. Mike, do people really believe the things they say on these shows that we watch, CNN, MSNBC, Fox, when these guests come on, do they actually believe what they're saying? Well, I think some do and some don't. But many are playing, many are playing a role. Uh, for reasons I won't bore you, just this week I was going through old correspondence and I came upon some emails that I had saved where the producer of, and this, this is now a 15 year old story, but it's as accurate today as it was then, where a producer who was casting a show said, we are, we are looking for someone to come on, and it actually was from the 2008 cycle, and, and speak to how radical Hillary's uh, view of health care is. And, and so, you know, that's typical in that, okay, here's an invitation. If you're prepared to say this, we've got a seat for you. But otherwise, we're going to find somebody else to, to fill that role because we know it's not, you know, what are the facts? Please come on and speak knowledgeably about this issue. But, but rather, you know, we are casting a part, and we'd like to know whether you'd like to play it. Mm -hmm. and, and is that something that you think is happening uh, today as well? I think that it's not as obvious as the email to which I've just referred. I think that it, it's almost unspoken. You know, depending on whose program you're invited onto, you, you can pretty much determine what your role or attended role is to be. And, and such is the moth to a flame attraction of people who want media attention. But there are people out there willing to play whatever role you're, and, and people with credentials, by the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mike, is there a code of journalistic ethics the way we lawyers have codes state to state? There's not. There are professional societies that have their own coda. Um, when, I, when I think about the difference in the industry that I have seen as it relates to your question, when I was first getting involved in talk radio, which was the end of the 80s, the fairness doctrine was just ending. The fairness doctrine was something that uh, obligated, and, and in fact, I can remember when I started at WWDB, even though it wasn't technically the, the law of the land, we still followed it. And the fairness doctrine obligated uh, someone with a platform to make sure that they were presiding both sides of an issue. And so in 1988, if I was a fill-in host and I wanted to put on a local candidate and I had invited a Democrat or an invited a Republican, I was obligated to extend that invitation to their opponent. Now, I'm often asked, do you think that we, we need to have the fairness doctrine again today? I think the fairness doctrine was premised on a notion of scarcity. And so I, I understand it then. But today, the media really is whatever you want it to be. Whatever opinion you're seeking is out there. I'm not for the fairness doctrine, but that's as close as we've come on my watch to having some kind of a standard. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, that we should, uh, or do you think that the news media should be looking to develop a code of ethics even beyond the fairness doctrine? For example, with respect to, to, to truth and veracity, that people when they go on a program, they should believe what they're saying. I mean, we lawyers are not, are not permitted to, to advocate without facts, right? Right. I'm, I'm for it, but how do you distinguish? I mean, you, there, there's, a, there's a night and day difference on certain cable channels between that which goes on during the day and that which goes on at night. Um, during the day, more news delivery at night much more opinion based. So I guess what I wrestle with is to whom would the standard apply? Would the entertainers? I mean, Stephen Colbert 
does one heck of a political show now as, an, as a comedian in the evening or, or Bill Maher. I, I'm wrestling with whether they would be obligated to follow it. Here's my own approach, and, and, and hence the justification for the ethics credit. I, I, can't claim, <laughs> I can't claim that I really thought of this uh, or that I use it as a guiding principle with, with rule 3.3 in mind. But it is my general approach. 3.3 is candor toward the tribunal. Make, make a lawyer shall not knowingly make a false statement of fact or law to a tribunal or fail to correct a false statement of material fact or law previous made to the tribunal by the lawyer. I mean, I feel like when I have, I offer plenty of opinion. I, 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 uh, I think I've got much more latitude with regard to the opinions that I offer, and hopefully there's a line that people can recognize as between something I've presented as fact and that, that which I've presented as opinion. But I do believe that I have a privilege that's been given to me with that microphone on radio or television, and that the obligation that's on my shoulder is to make sure that when I'm presenting a story, I am doing it in an accurate way, uh, much like the obligation that we all have when appearing in front of a court. Mm -hmm. And what percent of your colleagues feel the same obligation? I'm not holier than thou. I mean, I've made plenty of mistakes over the course of, of my career and used to have a much more partisan approach than I do today. That needs to be said right up front. Um, too few. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then you should ask, well, why? And I would say because the money is too good to play it the other way. Mm -hmm. And oh my God, how much easier it would be to just do a talking point form of news delivery, whether it's left or right. Because there are plenty of outlets out there and institutional forces that will tell you. I mean, we're having this conversation today uh, on a day when there's yet another impeachment hearing taking place. And when I leave here, my in bin will have a, a variety of, of talking points pre pre presented to me from sources on the left and sources on the right. And I'm amazed at how many broadcasters I will listen to who I can tell because I got the same missive. I'm just not following it. Turn on a microphone and read from it. Mm -hmm. Like you were described as a centrist by some in the introduction. Is that something that, that you agree with? I, I, I own that. Uh, I had been a registered Republican from that 1980 time period through, the, through 2010. I voted only for Republican candidates for president up to 2008. 2008, I voted for Barack Obama and was public about it because I thought I owed it to the audience. How can I talk politics day in and day out and now come to this major crossroads in my own life, go that direction and not share it? So I remained a Republican. My argument, by the way, is, is that the Republican Party left me long before I left the Republican Party. But by 2010, when changing my uh, driver's license in Pennsylvania, uh, they routinely say to you, as you know, are you registered to vote? And then they also say, would you like to change your affiliation? Uh, that year I said yes, and I, I really haven't looked back. Mm -hmm. In Pennsylvania, that keeps you from voting in primaries. How do you feel about that? Miserable. Um, so I... Uh, uh, it's funny because Attorney Bonin is here who represents me in these matters. Uh, I, uh, I, I say that part jokingly. I, I got to pay you a dollar to formalize this, this relationship. I did send you a book. That was compensation, wasn't it? Um, no, I, I really uh, take umbrage at the closed primary system that we have here in, in Pennsylvania. I have gone back, I should say this in, in full disclosure. In 2016, I could not sit out the Pennsylvania presidential primary. So I went back for the requisite time period to be a Republican to be able to vote and then left the party again. And I will tell you, if this Democratic field is as robust in 2020, I'll find it very hard to sit out and the only way I'll be able to participate will be to register as a Democrat to get into that primary and cast a ballot. I, I, I am very proud of the fact, Shane, and you know this, that I have never missed an election for which I've been eligible to vote. I have to word it that way because as an independent or nonpartisan affiliate in Pennsylvania, uh, I don't uh, get a say in a lot of primaries, but I've never missed one. Mike, let's shift gears for a minute and let's talk... Uh, <laughs> 
about how to deal with the news media. Uh, for those of us who are lawyers and those of us in this audience who are not lawyers, occasionally or perhaps more than that, we have an interest in dealing with the news media. What's your advice to both lawyers and non-lawyers as to how to, number one, approach the news media, and number two, deal with the news media? Uh, approach should be direct. And the, uh, I don't believe in, un unless there's a real good reason, and I think if you're an attorney, therefore acting on behalf of a client, uh, I don't think there's any need for anonymity or, or staying you know, in the brush, so to speak. And, and I think it's very important to understand there's a lot of verbiage that goes with the relationship between a source and a reporter. Uh, there's on the record, there's off the record, and there's a lot in between that depends on the particular definition of the journalist. So in lay terms, spell out what your expectation is. Would be, uh, would, and it's funny, these things don't often come up in, in my day to day because I, I'm not out there, time doesn't allow me to be uh, uh, an investigative journalist. The, the, I'll tell you this funny story though, the last time I've had to grapple with off the record was on September 9th of this year because I was in the White House for a meeting with the press secretary who suddenly said to me, he wants to see you now. And within 10 minutes and 15 yards away, I was one-on-one -on -one, uh, with Donald, President Trump in the Oval Office. She'd made it clear as we were walking to the Oval Office, this is off the record. And these days when you go into the West Wing, your phone is seized. And, uh, and put in a locker like it's a, a you know, bowling alley or something. So I had no phone. I had no means of recording the conversation. And I accepted off the record. Now, off the record to, to me meant nothing that's about to transpire in the Oval Office is fair game for you to share with anyone else. That's how I interpreted what she said to me. And, and I was comfortable uh, with that. Um, so therefore, I'm not going to tell you a thing as to what transpired. But interestingly, September 9th turns out to be a significant day because that is supposedly the day that Ambassador Sondland has a conversation with the president, the, the famous, you know, no quid pro quo, which the president then wrote out and flashed to the, uh, uh, to the media. Mm -hmm. Mike, Mike uh, do, you, do you think that your colleagues take off the record seriously? I really don't know, Shannon. I, um, I, I, just, I just don't know. I, I, the only thing I can offer of value is that I think that the media uh, is so lampooned these days, and yet I think we are living in quite a golden age of journalism on a national level. The, the Mueller report, in my opinion, didn't make an impact because by the time the Mueller report came out, we knew it all. And we knew it all because reporting from the Washington Post, CNN, the New York Times in, in snippets had told us everything. And so the report comes out and it's like, yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty damn bad, but what else you got? Well, isn't that enough? Um, I don't feel that way on a local level. I'm very, very concerned about journalism on a local level. And every time we see a story that says, in our own case, that the Inquirer or the Daily News have scaled back the newsroom or some other local newspaper, that's, that's a, a, a set of eyeballs not out there watching public servants any longer. And I think that should make all of us nervous. Mike, when you were a newsmaker and not a journalist, uh, would you talk to reporters on occasion on an off the record basis? I did, and, uh, and, and never to my benefit or so it seems based on the clips, mm -hmm. uh, but yes, I did. And was, was off the record honored? I never, I was never, no one ever broke an arrangement with me, uh, whether it was on or off the record, whether it was on background, uh, no, I never had that, that kind of an experience. Okay, you mentioned on background. What does on background mean? Different things to different people, which is why I, I think you need to, if you're a lawyer interacting with a member of the media and you want to share something, I would in, in very simplistic terms understand, say things like, you cannot use my name, you cannot use this information, 
You can use this information if you can corroborate it with another source because therein lie the different, the different definitions. What does on background mean to you? On background to me means I'm going, to, I'm going to share this with you. You cannot attribute it to me. I don't want you to attribute it to an unnamed center city lawyer either. Mm-hmm. If I give you this on background and you can go and get it corroborated from someone else, then you can count me as one of the sources, but you still can't name me. Mike, is off the record enforceable? As a legal matter, probably, probably not. Uh, I think it probably, I think the First Amendment would trump it. If you gave something to me and, and our understanding was that it was off the record and I published it nonetheless, I, I, I think you'd be on the weaker ground. Mm-hmm. Is, that the, is that the correct outcome? Is that the correct outcome? It's probably the only outcome as I think about it. And how about on background? Same thing? <sighs> probably the same thing. Mm-hmm. And you're now talking as an American, a, journal, a journalist, a lawyer, a consumer of news. How are you talking now? Uh, someone who's conflicted because I've been all of the above. Uh, yeah, they're not, they're not easy standards, Shane, and I, I don't have a better answer. What's going to happen uh, uh, when slash if we get past the current presidency in terms of how we all regard news in America. Are things going to change, change for the better, change for the worse, if that's possible? I keep hoping that the pendulum is going to swing. Uh, I, I am not here as a detractor of any particular news outlet, nor am I here to, to sell my own wares as a talk radio host or a, a CNN host. I am an advocate for you doing one thing, and that is changing the channel. Hopefully not on Saturday mornings at 9 a.m. But um, what I mean by that is I'm, I'm just stunned by, I'll say it this way, never before have we had so many informational choices, and yet it seems that so few of us are taking advantage of that opportunity. Instead, we're, we're siloed away where our perspective is uh, you know, governed by MSNBC and Slate or Salon and Huffington Post, or we're at the other extreme and it's an AM version of talk radio and it's Fox News and it's the Drudge Report, and it's as if never the two shall meet. And something else that I see is that many of us are now getting our news from social media sources like Facebook and thinking that we are getting a nice complement of stories and not really realizing that they have your number. You know, they, they, I'm sure we've all had the experience where you're, you're shopping for a retail product. In fact, if this has gotten so bad now that I'm, I'm in the market for something, you know, a, a chair, a pair of shoes, something, and I find myself, before I put in a search engine, whatever that might be, thinking, do I really now want to put up with the ads of whatever it is that I'm in search of. I had this happen with a chair recently. That's why it's on my mind. And I'm, I'm being stalked by chairs from all over the country now. <laughs> See, you laugh because we've all had the experience. But what people don't recognize is the same thing is happening with your, your stories. You, you click because something looked interesting, and it was a story from a political perspective, and you don't realize, perhaps, that now, because you expressed an interest in this, You're being flooded with similar stories, stories that strike a a similar tone. So we sit back and we think, well, geez, I'm well read. I just read X, Y, and Z, not knowing that you've been fed a steady diet of something that reinforces your views. Mm -hmm. Mike, I want to go back, if we could, to uh, your obligations as a journalist with respect to your guests on the radio or on television. Uh, How do you handle it when... A guest says to you, Mike, I'll come on your show, but it's only to talk about this subject and not that subject. What do you do about that? Tough. uh, It's really it doesn't come up all that often, but it's a it's a difficult circumstance when you really want a guest. And usually the reason you want them is because of that which they won't address. Uh, I can't think of a circumstance where I've taken that deal where I've said, I I agree not to ask you about this. There is a negotiation that that takes place sometimes for these for these appearances. Uh, It's quite routine that the higher profile the guest, the more likely that a staff member will say, well, what exactly is the area of of inquiry? I I used to go through this 
uh, I used to go through this with President Obama, who I interviewed eight or nine times, most of which while he was president. And there was a bit of a dance that would take place. You know, we, we've, we, we've got you slated in. Someone would call, and you're going to have uh, 12 minutes on the radio with them. What, what sort of things do you think you'll want to get into? And Shannon, I don't profess to have the correct answer in this. I can only tell you how I handled it. I don't have a problem saying, well, I'm sure I'm going to talk about the hunt for bin Laden or the Affordable Care Act uh, or, you know, the economy. Uh, as opposed to, well, I will, here are my questions I will be asking uh, of the president. I, I have to say that I've, I play this, that's how I handle a newsmaker, but I've, I have uh, woven together a segment with guests that are not front page newsmakers and it's not of a political nature. Uh, I'm trying to think of a, of a, of a good example of where I... Uh, uh, usually it happens because I've had someone on radio where time is at my disposal and I can do a 20-minute interview. And then all of a sudden, I, I, this, this person really struck a chord with me and so now I want to bring them on CNN where, frankly, four and a half minutes is a typical segment. And I worry that you're going to be lulled into thinking it's a 20-minute interview and it's not and you gotta, you got to get to it. So in some circumstances, like with a book author, I might have a conversation with you in advance and say, I loved you being on my program. We don't have time for all that. Here are the three things I'm getting into. John, John Dorenboss was, an, I thought, an excellent guest of mine on CNN last Saturday. He was the long snapper for the Eagles, magician, friend of Ellen, finalist in America's Got Talent, and just wrote a memoir about the fact that when he was 12, his father killed his mother. And, uh, and he had to rebound from all of that. He, I, had him on, I had him on Sirius XM, and it, it was a great lengthy interview. Now I wanted him on television, and, and I, I didn't want... So <clears throat> that's the kind of circumstance where I might say, John, I covered a lot of turf with you on radio, but it's really just these three things that we're going to have to drill down on. I don't see any ethical issue in a circumstance like that. Obviously, if he were a member of Congress and I said, here are the three questions, that would be different. All right, let's go back to Obama for a moment, if we could. You mentioned that you supported President Obama when he ran for president in 2008. True. Uh, and uh, Simon made the reference that you had the first interview with President Obama uh, as a radio journalist in the White House. That's not quite the way he put it, but I know that's, in fact, what occurred. So let's Let's go back to that moment in 2009. You're invited to go to the White House to interview President Obama. You're the first journalist from radio to do so. You know that you've been selected for that purpose because you had, you had stepped forward and, and endorsed uh, then-Senator Obama when he ran for president. You're going to get, what was it, half an hour with? 30 minutes, one-on-one. Thir on one. 30 minutes, one-on-one -on -one with the president. You know it's going to be live on CNN, correct? And Fox and MSNBC. And you know that you're getting this because he considered you to be as close as there was to a friend, and I put that in quotation marks, in the news media. Not that you, not that you were going to be soft, but that you had been for him. Right. So he felt most comfortable with you as opposed to anybody else. No doubt. That's so true. How, so how does that affect your willingness or unwillingness to ask him a really tough question in those 30 minutes. I think it puts a lot of pressure on me in a circumstance like that. And, um, and that pressure is even more attenuated now because partisanship has gotten so much uh, more strident since Barack Obama. I'm not snarky. I'm, I'm not, first of all, I, I, I go into the White House knowing that unless... I'm just going to slow down and, and tell you this in, in, in a better level of detail. About a week in advance of the interview, this was August of 2009, uh, phone rings and I am invited to come in and they said, you can have 30 minutes, we'll invite the cable stations, we don't know if they'll take it, they did. You can also include live radio callers, which was quite an intangible when I think about that. Um, no subjects are off limit. And I, I was thrilled with it, and I remember taking thousands of suggestions from radio listeners via my website as to what should I ask of the president um, before going to Washington on the, the train that particular morning at family dinner. Our boys were then uh, 10, 12, and 14. 
And the suggestions even came on the home front. One of the boys said, Dad, make sure you ask him about the Book of Secrets. And I said, okay, remind me. And he said, well, Dad, we just saw Nicolas Cage in National Treasure 2. And when the president's elected, he gets the Resolute Desk and the Book of Secrets. And the Book of Secrets explains who killed Kennedy, what's in Area 51, and did we really land on the moon? And I said, all right, I'm going to try and work that in, but no promises. So I, I over-prepared for the interview. And I, what I hadn't planned on, though, was that President Obama would, would walk into the room two minutes early before the mics are hot. And there are media members, like all of you, lined up watching this live interview. They had no role in it other than to observe it. And there's an expression in my business, which is you don't leave it in the locker room. You don't want to have a conversation during a commercial break because guests, even presidents, get confused as to whether they already said something. In other words, I've got to make stupid talk with him. So you should know where this is going. He extends a hand. I extend a hand. I say, what's in the book of secrets? He says, I tell you, but I'd have to kill you. <laughs> so, you know, ice is broken. Um, now, now, the interview, now the interview begins. If I, I knew that half the audience wanted me to knee him in the groin, and if I had left doing anything shy of that, you know, then, the, then it was a waste from their perspective. And I've been in this position many, many times, and I hope I'll be in it again, where I, my, my response is, is to ask the difficult question. I don't do it with snark, but I don't do it, with, I don't do it that way with any kind of a, a, a guest. That I, it's just not the way that I do it. And there are some who are very effective um, by having more of an edge. Maybe I need to have more of an edge. But I wanted to make sure that I could go home without someone saying, well, you didn't ask about this. For example, Shannon, I was back in the White House uh, on, uh, on President Obama's watch one month before the re-election in 2012. And the hot issue at the time was Benghazi. And so I went in, and it, this was now in the Oval Office, and the first question, I think it was the first question that I asked was, you know, where exactly were you as those events were playing them, you know, the question everybody wanted to know and wanted to have asked. Um, by the way, the day after the interview where I asked about the Book of Secrets, the Associated Press ran a story in 400 newspapers across the country, and the headline, which I have at home, was Obama Mum on Book of Secrets. <laughs> and if you read the story, the only subject, I talked about the Affordable Care Act, Bin Laden, cash for clunkers, everything. The only thing they covered was that one exchange. <laughs> okay, well, I have a lot more questions, but let's pause at this moment to see if we have some audience questions. Well, as an observer of the media, or maybe a uh, consumer of the media, I'm concerned, concerned with the lack of civility in much of today's media. Sure, I mean, repeat, repeat, repeat this question back, okay? I'm equally concerned that our, in my mind, no, I'm like saying so, our former president has repeatedly demonized the mainstream media as fake news. Do uh, you share my concerns? Absolutely. The question is about civility and the impact that the president's uh, labeling of the media as fake news has had. It's very, it's very hard uh, to distinguish you know, truth from fiction if he's convinced a significant portion of the country that everything that comes out of a source that he doesn't like is, is fake news. Uh, I'm very troubled by the incivility. I worry about our kids, my own in particular, because of their ages. They don't know any climate other than this one. And so they think this is the way that it's always been. And I, I think that something that has, that has poured accelerant on this fire is technology. You know, I, I am a product of an era when uh, there were things called dates. That means you actually went out and did something with her. And in order to get a date, you had to work that rotary dial or push button phone and live in fear that the old man would answer it. And then you'd have to talk through him in order to get to her. I've got three sons who seem to get it all done with their thumbs, you know, <laughs> on electronic devices. And what I note is that the television work that I do has raised my profile when I travel. And people will engage me in conversation like didn't happen when I was a radio personality. I've never, knock on wood, I've never had an unpleasant moment 
with someone who sought me out to talk about things that I'd said. Don't misunderstand that. That doesn't mean that people don't approach me and say, you said this and I disagree with it. Oh no, that happens routinely. But never a nasty exchange. Never something when I've been fearful. If you were to take a look at my Twitter feed or Facebook page or any of the other social media components where people sound off, everybody gets beer muscles. You know, all of a sudden, they're the drunk in the bar at 2 a.m. saying things that they would never have said at 8 p.m. when they first walked into the place. And and I think that that has been a a, a major factor in in dragging down, to your question, um, the level of discourse and bringing on the, the incivility. Not too long ago, a well-known government figure made a comment to the media, perhaps at a press conference. Shortly after that, it was conclusively proven that that comment was false. When asked to comment on it, his comment was, I have no duty to tell the truth. I may choose to tell the truth, I may choose not to tell the truth. That's my decision. Now, do you, as the journalist, when you interview that person or another person, if you know they're lying to you, will you call them on the carpet? Or will you play the referee and maybe say, just let them talk, let the public decide, let somebody else decide? Do you think it's your job giving an interview to sort of, you know, Give him the rope to hang himself, so to speak, With, or herself. Within, within reason, I think I have an obligation. If I'm conducting that interview and you say something to me that I know to be false, I think I've got an obligation to call you out. When I say within reason, uh, I only mean that I think, and you may all disagree with this, but I think that, that in the current climate, it's almost to excess. When every single thing is called out, It almost perpetuates this perception that the media, hypothetically, is against this individual, whoever this individual might be. Um, I'm not so good at this. I did an interview three weeks ago with Rand Paul. And I was, I was interviewing Rand Paul about the impeachment process, and he said a number of things that people, uh, via social media, said to me, you should have called him out for X, Y, and Z. And I went back and I took a look at the interview and I thought, geez, there's some truth to that. I probably should have. Sometimes you look at a journalist and you say, well, they must be biased because they let that pass. Not recognizing that in an instance like that, I was conducting an interview in a little ante room adjacent to a ballroom where I'd just spoken to 500 people. I had to catch a plane in order to do this interview, and if we didn't get it done within eight minutes, I was going to miss my flight back to Philadelphia. In other words, stuff happens, and sometimes there are things going on in the orbit of the interview that you might not take into consideration. And sometimes I'm guilty of making the mistake, which is to not be a good listener. You know, Shannon, Shannon teaches a course. In fact, I'll ask him about it uh, in my portion of questioning him, how to ask a question. Um, I I think that in order to to do what I do and be good at it is to not only ask a decent question, but also to be a good listener. And and the the problem is that I'll go in with notes and I'll I'll have four things that I want to cover and I've asked you about number three and you've just given me something that I should be pursuing, but something gets in my head and I I need to get to number four. Um, So... I don't know if that answers your, your question. I, uh, if you tell me a blatant falsehood and I know it, shame on me for not saying, you know, wait a minute, Senator, Congressman, Mr. President, whomever it might be, that's just not the case. Okay, and Mike, when you say you have an obligation to correct it, what is the root of that obligation in your, in your mind? Is that because you are legally trained? Is that because you were trained by your parents? Is that because of your sense of, of, of citizenship? Is it of a sense of being a, an appropriate journalist? And if so, where does that come from? I mean, where, what, what is the wellspring of, your, of the use of the word obligation? Right, so I guess it comes from, in my case, I think you're asking me not only about a professional responsibility, but also a moral compass. Um, 
which is a presumptive question. But, uh, you know, I, to the extent I have one, I think it has come from the way in which I was raised, community uh, uh, factors, education, not frankly, a a big religious influence in my case. I'm a cafeteria Catholic. It means I go through the aisle and I I take the turkey sandwich, but I leave the jello. I'm not in for the whole program. (laughs) Thank you, Shannon. I appreciate the. I'm here all week. Um, (laughs) So, uh, but it's not as if I've been formally trained. I was a journalism major, so I think I picked up some of the grounding for that, but it's it's Potter Stewart. It's pornography. I know it when I see it. Uh Okay. And I I also don't, I mean, finally on that question, I, I also... What matters most to me is my reputation. I, I don't mind the criticism that's unfounded. It goes with the territory. But I, I don't want you telling me, you a person I respect, hey, you should have asked this question and you didn't. That matters to me. You know, I'm held in check by the fact that what I'm doing in the media is in plain view. That's a big uh, a factor, I think. Yes, sir. I have a question. Um, You hear the New York Times reports or Washington Post reports. How do they get this report? Do they have leaks inside or they have inside sources? Did you have a question? Where do they get those? Well, I I think a combination of uh, of those of those examples that you give. They, they have people, Shannon was asking me, what does it mean to be uh, on background, off the record, and so on and so forth. People love to talk. And, and every once in a while, there's a story that runs in a major outlet, and when it happens, and if it was a negative story toward the president, he'll be the first to tell you, look at that, they got it wrong. There have been a handful of those on his watch. Um, my outlet made some of them, but They are so far outweighed by all of the reporting that has been absolutely accurate. We wouldn't know about the whole Russia probe, the things that we know that that made the Mueller report almost inconsequential without all that great investigative journalism that was based on sources who didn't want to risk their position uh, by having their name in the paper. But, I mean, look at the impeachment process. Even if you don't believe it rises to the level of an impeachable offense, I think people have to acknowledge that the underlying facts are really not in dispute. Everybody's telling this. I, I heard today, as, as, as before coming here, um, someone in the, in the context of, of the hearing say, well, there's such factual disputes in all of this. I don't think there are any factual disputes. I think there's a pretty clear narrative. And how do we know that? Well, because a whistleblower came forward. I mean, that whistleblower is an example of, of the type of person you're, you're talking about. And, and frankly, I think their identity doesn't matter one iota because everything that person has said has been corroborated. Now, if it were only the whistleblower, then I think we'd need to know their, their name and put them uh, in, on a stage and take a look at them. Okay, when, when they say the Washington Post, or do the, does the newspaper follow that up and make sure it's the truth of what they're reporting? I think they do to the best of their ability and if they don't and someone else can prove that what they had was wrong, there's an incentive for them to to cast doubt on the post. Okay. It's on. What do you recommend for those of us who are trying to get a balanced view of the news, who are trying to avoid confirmation bias? So uh, my day begins between 4.45 and 5. This I don't recommend for you. It's just this is what I do for a living. And on my laptop, bookmarked, I have 30 different sources. I can't tell you that I read each of them thoroughly, but I'm looking at all of them every day. And before I go to bed, I'm looking at those same sources. And in those sources, I have the Drudge Report. I have Fox News. I try not to go to bed at night without seeing Sean Hannity's opening monologue. But at the same time, I want to click over and hear what Rachel Maddow has to say. Of course, I feel some sense of loyalty to Chris Cuomo, but I've got the Huffington Post tagged. I've got Slate and Salon.com. You got to mix it up, you know, and somewhere in the midst of all of that lies the truth. I would not point you to any one outlet nor even to my own programs and say, well, simply listen to me and you'll know what to think. Absolutely not. 
Um, but, but the climate and the competition is such that it's, it's almost incumbent on you to, to, to get involved and make sure that you are aggressively looking at a lot of different outlets. Facebook made uh, the decision a week ago to say that they're going to cover any political ad, anything that, that's a commercial, anything that's paid to them, and they will cover it. Twitter made the, the exact opposite, saying they don't want to be involved in politics. They're not going to take that money. Right. They don't like where that's taking America. What is the Sir Smirconish prescription to bring back civility uh, to American uh, politics? So one observation. Twitter gets credit for saying we're not taking political dollars, and they deserve some credit, but it was a minuscule portion of their revenue source in comparison to Facebook. In other words, it was a very easy decision for them to make. For Facebook, it would be an enormous decision to say that we're not going to uh, take that money. I, I think it is, I don't, we haven't quite sorted out all the ramifications of the internet era in which we're living, including this one. If you're running an ad on Channel 6, on the local ABC affiliate, you're a campaign and you're putting that ad on the air, I think it's not too much to expect that someone at Channel 6 has taken a look at that content, and Shannon's been in this position where ads, they've refused to run ads in the past. Um, I think it's too much to expect that Facebook is going to be able to provide the appropriate level of oversight given their size. So I don't know what the answer is. I, I mean, it seems a little draconian to me to say, Facebook, you shouldn't have any political advertising whatsoever. At the same time, they're so damn big, I don't know how they could properly police it all. It's, the funny thing is I get, I get caught in the ringer on this because I promote live shows that I do across the country, and there's a box that has to be checked as to whether the content is political. I just want to run a little ad that says, spend $45 and come see me in St. Louis. And I have to check the box, and then I've got to wait like 48 hours until someone theoretically does look at just the print ad and decide, oh, it's okay. You know, so, so because someone in Macedonia is putting out anti-Hillary things, I'm the one who's paying the price, which is a little ridiculous. Another question here. Yeah. <clears throat> We've heard that you've uh, been in the company of a lot of presidents in the White House several times, and you've also been told this is off the record. Do you get a different feeling with each president that off the record means something different? There was nothing in my off the record conversation with President Trump that would surprise anybody in this room, assuming you're all paying attention, and I know that you are. It was exactly what you would have expected the conversation to be, perhaps a bit more ribald than mm -hmm. anticipated. Um, so I don't know that it was even necessary for me to have been told this is, this is off the record. Um, but off the record is not something I, I would have expected if, if George Herbert Walker Bush had granted me an audience. <coughs> It, I, I don't think there would have been the need for, for saying that you're in the company of a president, this is off the record. I, I think instead that president would have conducted himself in a manner that didn't necessitate saying this is off the record. I hope that makes some sense. But yeah. Sometimes off the record, it's a blink of the eye, you know. True. Well, and Shane, look, Shannon makes a great point, which is in asking me about that first Obama interview, hey, you'd like to come back, right? And if you, if you conduct yourself in a, in a way that, um, that is to their satisfaction, I guess you increase your, your odds. I, I want to be known as simply being fair. He will ask you a direct question. He will give you the opportunity to answer that question. If they say that about me, that's, that's fine. That's all I could ask. Should we switch gears? Because I'm mindful of that, uh, that clock. It's up to you. Yeah, I think, I think, I think we should. Okay, well thank you for for those those questions. That was that was great. So what what is your recollection as to how we first met? Uh, this is a matter of some dispute, but uh, 
Uh, I do know that in August of 1980, which uh, was 39 plus years ago, uh, my father had a fundraising event in Philadelphia uh, at uh, the Bellevue featuring then former Governor Ronald Reagan. And Michael uh, crashed the event because he did not have the requisite funds to purchase a ticket. And uh, he, he got somebody to take a Polaroid, uh, the same camera I suppose he used with Larry Kane, of, of himself with Governor Reagan. And uh, we, we did shake hands at that point in time. And I, I do think that is when we met. Uh, uh, I think Michael's memory of that is perhaps a little brighter than mine. It was a $250 fundraiser in the Rose Garden at the Bellevue. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mark of how things change. Uh, we had a hard time filling that very small room, notwithstanding the fact that Governor Reagan was then the nominee for president of his party. But Ronald Reagan in Philadelphia in 1980 was not popular at all. And it was, it was, it was tough to fill that room. So we were happy to have Michael there, uh, invited or not. Shane, and I, I said that I've spent my entire life in a 50-mile radius. How about you? Pretty much the same. Uh, I went to high school here at Penn Charter. I went to Haverford College and uh, Penn's Law School. I say Penn's Law School and not Penn Law School because uh, we, we got a little bit of a name change thing happening over there right now. Uh, and uh, I spent a year at Cambridge University along the way. That's not currently in Philadelphia. Uh, and uh, I do, uh, I do uh, uh, have the same track as, as you. I've spent my entire professional life here. I have found myself in, in winters more recently teaching on the West Coast. I, I teach uh, some courses at Hastings and Berkeley and Stanford Law Schools uh, in tort, evidence, and related areas, uh, in part because I can't stand the winters here in Philadelphia. Uh, but aside from that, I have spent my entire life here in Philadelphia. And I'm very invested in the community in every way. And I'm delighted to see so much progress here in our community. Did you attend law school expecting to be a lawyer? Absolutely. Why? Well, I grew up with a lawyer as a father, and I came to respect the law and how the law could be used as, as an instrument of appropriate change, whether it's criminal law or civil law. And I believe that I uh, could add to that change as an attorney. I did not know what area of law I wanted to go into. I really had no idea at all. As a first year student at Penn, I asked my father for advice as to where I should work for that first summer. And he said, go find a good lawyer to work for. And I replied, well, the career office has a, a list of lots of good firms. And he said, no, I didn't tell you to go work for a good firm. I told you to go work for a good lawyer. Because there are a lot of mediocre lawyers in good firms. And there are a lot of good lawyers in mediocre firms. And your job for the summer is to find the best lawyer you can to work for, to mentor you to teach you about how to be a lawyer. So I asked him for that list of good lawyers, since that was not available in the career office. And he gave me a list. I sent 12 letters. Uh, you all know what a letter is, don't you? It's what we used to, it's what we used to have before we, had, yeah. before we had emails. And I tell law students today, and I, I teach, uh, not only do I teach at, at Hastings and Stanford and Berkeley, I also teach at Penn. And I tell law students today, if you're looking for a job, don't send an email, send a letter, because we lawyers don't get letters anymore, do we? And we like to get some letters. Wouldn't that be nice to get something in your inbox aside from a circular? So uh, I sent 12 letters, and I uh, got uh, three uh, offers for summer employment, one of which was with James E. Beasley, who was also Michael's employer at a later time. And I worked there and met this good-looking uh, skinny guy, Tom Klein, in the summer of 1982. And Tom was in his third year of practice at the Beasley firm. 
And on the first day of work, which I think was May 10th of 1982, I showed up early and was told to grab a box and we jumped into Jim Beasley's crappy Subaru and drove to Camden, New Jersey, where Jim and Tom tried a product liability case for seven weeks. And what could be a better education for a young law student than to be with Jim Beasley and Tom Klein and learn at their feet as they're trying a product liability case. So after that, it was obvious to me what I should be doing with my career professionally, and I joined the Beasley firm <clears throat> upon graduation from law school in 1984, and Tom and I practiced there together until January of 1995, when we formed Klein and Spectre, and uh, we're now in our 25th year. What was it about the prospect of actually trying cases that attracted you? Well, I think each of us as an attorney has to find their own place of professional satisfaction. And I know there are lots of lawyers who get great satisfaction out of doing corporate work or real estate work or drafting uh, trusts and estates documents or uh, helping on family law matters or doing criminal defense work uh, or being a prosecutor. For me, I thought that helping people who were catastrophically injured was a wonderful undertaking. Uh, I listened to Alan's comments earlier today about his work, and Alan has made brilliant contributions to our community and to, and to really the world for what he's done, particularly in the terrorism cases that he's handled. When somebody comes to your office and they're terribly injured and uh, they have no sustenance, they have no way to, su to support their family or themselves, they need medical assistance, they need medical appliances, they need to replace earnings or earning capacity, or they have a child that may be terribly injured, or they may have lost through a wrongful death uh, someone who was the breadwinner in a family. That's a, that's a catastrophic event, and that requires someone who is prepared to dedicate themselves to help that person. As I'm, I'm sure you all know, most of those tragedies do not eventuate in civil litigation because uh, we don't have a fault-free system uh, in the tort field. We have a fault-based system. And uh, our experience, the client inspector, and I'm sure it is at other firms where lawyers are in this room in cases like those, we end up accepting for representation less than one case out of 100 that come to us because of the difficulties in being successful in those matters, proving duty, breach, causation, damages, and having resources in the, in, with the defendants satisfactory to pay a settlement or a verdict. That's five pegs and they all must be satisfied. But it's very rewarding to be able to handle cases such as those for people who are, are terribly aggrieved. And one thing that we've done, and Simon said this in his introductory remarks, is we have tried to bring a little different focus to our practice. And I consider this to be an ethical precept, although regrettably it is not part of the current canons of ethics that we lawyers are required to ascribe to, and, and I think it should be, but that is that we look at a case and we say to ourselves and to each other, should we require the defendant to change their practices as a condition of resolution of the case? Now, in a typical, let's say, motor vehicle accident case with an intersectional collision, I'm not talking about requiring a remedy such as that because uh, a momentary lapse of judgment causing a motor vehicle accident should not call for that person to lose their license to operate a motor vehicle. And the same thing is true about a defective sidewalk that might, that might cause an injury. Hopefully the shopkeeper will, will know enough to fix their sidewalk. But what we see, regrettably, is we see systemic practices from time to time be it in a hospital, be it with uh, the police force, with the Department of Education, with product manufacturers, with others where a lot of people 
uh, are being very badly injured. And so we have spoken up and said to the defendants, of course, obtaining client authority first for this proposition, that we're not going to resolve the case with you unless A, you pay compensation that's adequate for the harm, and B, that you change your practices. I think that there ought to be a change to the canons that, that requires lawyers to consider their work as it relates to the public good. Consider. I think we could start with consider. We don't, we don't have to go beyond that, at least not today. And part of the public good means when you're representing folks in a personal injury suit to consider how you might be able to reform uh, the defendant's practices, which might lead to a safer society. Give us an example, if you're able, if you're permitted, of something, a change like that that you've been able to bring about. Well, there are so many changes. I mean, I think about Tom Klein's recent case uh, involving uh, a young man who was delivering pizza in West Philadelphia, and he was uh, wrongfully mistaken for a criminal by plainclothes police officers who did not identify themselves when they approached him, uh, and they approached him very vigorously, and there were three of them. And he, of course, thought he was about to be robbed because there's no job more dangerous in our city than, than being a, a, a delivery person. I think we all know that. And he fled, and his reward for fleeing was to be shot in the face. And uh, Tom required the police department as a condition of settlement to change their practices and their policies requiring plainclothes police officers to immediately identify themselves, both verbally and visually, to a person that they're approaching. Now that would seem to be fundamental, but it wasn't. Tom, did I misdescribe that? Yeah. And, and I think if you, if, you think about, if you think about your role as a lawyer, you have a case like that. You know, of course you have to get fair compensation for this young man who's been, who's been shot in the head. Uh, with the bullet remaining in his body, is that correct, Tom? Yeah. Uh, and that's a very important duty on, on your part. But, but what about the other 1.6 million citizens in Philadelphia? who are inferentially depending upon you as a lawyer to prevent an unjust and undue risk to themselves. Because any of us, if we were vigorously approached by three people who were wearing sweatshirts and hoodies, okay, we would be in fear of our lives. And we would, we would run if we could. And that would, that would risk being shot. So yeah, I think it's important that all of us look at cases from that perspective. Um, and we've done that over and over again. Uh, hospitals in Philadelphia are all trying to, to do the right thing. There, there's nobody that goes into health care to do anything except provide good medical services. I think we all know that. Uh, I'm not sure why doctors and lawyers have to fight so hard against each other. I think we all know that about doctors and nurses. But sometimes there are systemic problems in hospitals. And as a result, people get injured or, or, or die. And we lawyers, when we have those cases, need to look at those cases and say, should we say to the hospital, look, you're going to have to change this procedure because this could happen again. And hospitals actually are receptive to having that conversation because they do want to do the right thing. And sometimes we've had that conversation with hospitals through their counsel, and they've said, we've already changed the procedure, and here's how we've changed it. Or they've said, uh, that's worth considering. Uh, we're going to talk about it, and we'll then say to them, please get back to us. Please tell us what you're going to do. Sometimes they'll say to us, we'll change the procedures, but we don't want you taking credit for it. And our answer to that is, OK, that's fine. Because we'd rather not have the credit, but have the change, than have uh, credit for nothing and no change and just more injuries. 
You referenced the low acceptance rate of cases at your firm in terms of that which you're asked to screen and that which you ultimately accept. What are some of the ethical considerations of the screening process and, and, and how can not just you and your firm, but the industry safeguard against the temptation of putting something into suit because the potential defendant is deep pocketed? Well, I think that that for those lawyers who at one time might have been incentivized to take cases for so-called nuisance value, I think that day has long since passed. I believe that defendants, especially corporate defendants, especially especially well-heeled corporate defendants, uh, are not going to pay anything. Uh, and not even nuisance value to resolve a matter that they know has no uh, shadow of merit because they do, want, they do not want to incentivize additional meritless lawsuits. So I, I don't think we have to be as concerned today as perhaps once was the case about lawyers who would bring claims without a reasonable basis. We all know, however, that that's not the Chamber of Commerce uh, and Business Roundtable line, is it, about lawyers and their work? So what they say repetitively is, is that we have a huge problem in this country with <clears throat> frivolous lawsuits, meritless lawsuits. Now, the problem that corporate America has is not with frivolous lawsuits. It's with merited lawsuits. It's with lawsuits that have uh, a, a good basis in fact and in law. Uh, the, the mirror image of that, Mike, is the defendant who will not pay anything at all or anything but nuisance value for the highly meritorious case because they think they can exhaust the claimant, the plaintiff, and exhaust her attorney and her attorney's law firm. And we've seen that over and over again with Johnson & Johnson. And I, I hate to to name a name except that it has to be said. Uh, I, I've not seen that, by the way, with most other corporations. Uh, yes, they don't settle claims immediately, but they do eventually because they don't want to have a trial and lose a case and have uh, a reputational harm with regard to the company or the product and they're worried about paying more by way of a judgment than, they, than by way of a settlement. That's not all defendants, but it's, it's most of them. But Johnson & Johnson is a different kind of a, of a corporation. They're, as I think you probably know, a conglomeration of a lots of different divisions and lots of areas. Consumer products making things like talcum powder and medical devices uh, making things like transvaginal mesh uh, and, and hips and pharmaceuticals uh, making uh, drugs that are like uh, Risperdal and the like, and they're facing right now 23 separate sets of mass tort actions. That is to say, many different claimants per set of products across the whole range of their divisions, totaling 103,000 lawsuits. And their calculated strategy is to simply exhaust the plaintiffs and exhaust their lawyers. And they've been remarkably successful. Uh, regrettably, in the transvaginal mesh area, they have faced about 50,000 lawsuits and they've settled most of them for what I regard as peanuts. That's a complex legal term. <laughs> And uh, why have they done that? They've done that because they've had winning allies among the plaintiff's bar. Uh, too many of our colleagues have been willing to accept too many cases against a company like Johnson & Johnson. And then they're in a position where they can't actually discover and try all the cases because they have simply too many. So there are law firms that have uh, garnered, believe it or not, six or eight or 10,000 cases against Johnson & Johnson. And then they're 
given an order by a federal judge to discover their cases. And you all know what it means to, to discover a case, right? Get documents, take depositions, get expert reports. And that's okay if it's one case or five, or if you have some help, 10. But if you have an order to discover 6,000 cases, what are you gonna do? You're, you're, gonna, you're gonna beg for peace with the defendant. And the defendant will then offer you the lowest amount of money that they think your client could possibly accept. Right? The lowest amount of money that you could then take to your client to say, this is the best I can do for you. Well, of course it's the best that you can do for them because you weren't prepared to do anything for them. You're not prepared to try their case or discover their case because you have too many. Why does a lawyer take 6,000 cases? He takes 6,000 cases because 6,000 times one-third of a small number is an extremely large number. And that is something about which we as professionals should not be proud. And here again, I think there is a change that we should look to make to the ethical rules. And that is that I think that a judge should have the responsibility to assure that the lawyer that is practicing in her courtroom is able to handle the case in front of her. I don't think that's too much to ask. I don't think it's too much to ask a judge to make at least a cursory assessment of whether the attorney practicing in that courtroom is able to handle the case. And I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about a high degree of competence. I'm not even talking necessarily about competence. I'm just talking about actually physically able to handle the case. If you're in a three-person law firm and you've got 6,000 cases in that courtroom, it is not possible for you to be able, able, A-B-L-E, able to handle that case. Now, do I think, do I think that a lawyer in a three-person firm could see to it that 6,000 clients would have lawyers to help them competently? Of course, you, you could make arrangements with other firms around the country to bring in the help that you would need to handle 6,000 cases. But, but clients are not properly served when lawyers negotiate these uh, bargain basement settlements. Uh, I know this is not an area of practice for most of you, so maybe what I'm saying to you is somewhat foreign. However, I'll bet all of you have had the displeasure of watching television and seeing the ads on television for one product or the other. And I'm sure that you've wondered, who are these lawyers? Who are these law firms? And are they really able to provide legal services to these clients that are commensurate with the harms that are alleged? How often do you see conflict in a trial setting or in a pretrial setting between your obligation to be a provider of zealous advocacy and fairness toward your opponent or your opponent's attorney, maybe through a mistake on their part. That's a mistake to your advantage, and now the question is what you're going to do about it. Do those type of situations arise often? And if so, what do you do? Uh, they don't arise all that often, but they do arise sometimes. And I concede that that does pose somewhat of a mental conflict for me when I see my opponent make a mistake that I think hurts his client and helps my client. Uh, but in order to take advantage of that mistake, I have to file a legal paper. And uh, I feel bad about that. Um, but I recognize that under the canons, I have an obligation to zealously advocate for my client, right? Does anybody in this room not know that that is our, that, that is our duty as attorneys? Zealous representation. Zealous. That's the word. That, that means that it's not a popularity contest, right? You, you, just, you just can't, you cannot discharge your obligation to represent your client zealously if you regard the practice as a popularity contest. Uh, Tom and I have had a circumstance in the last couple of years 
again with Johnson & Johnson, where their attorneys have made uh, bad mistakes. In, in a case that Tom tried, they failed to file their appellate papers on time. Tom won the, the, the trial, and Johnson & Johnson didn't get their appeal papers filed on time. That might seem absolutely incredible to imagine that J&J &J wouldn't do that, but that's exactly what happened. And that posed the issue for Tom pretty squarely. Tom, how long did it take you to, to consider that issue? <laughs> Less than one second. <laughs> and and it, it was a difficult trial, Tom says. I, I don't think his answer would have been any different if it had been an easy trial. And so Tom opposed the late filing of the appellate papers, and the appeal was thrown out, and the, the discharge of the appeal was affirmed by the Superior Court, and the Supreme Court denied Alicotter, and uh, the judgment was paid. Now, who paid the judgment ultimately, whether it was J&J &J or their law firm? I don't know. Then, almost unbelievably, but true, uh, more recently, uh, two younger lawyers in our firm obtained a very large verdict against Johnson & Johnson involving the same product, and what happened, but they didn't file their appellate papers on time. <laughs> And it's, it's, almost, it's almost beyond beyond belief, I know, that that could have happened, but it did. <coughs> On this occasion, there was something approaching an explanation. I, I didn't say an excuse, because we all know the difference between an excuse and an explanation, right? The explanation, uh, in part, involved the fact that we had that cyber attack on the filing system here in, in Philadelphia County. And that combined with the fact that the attorney for Johnson & Johnson was not checking the dockets, even though she could manually by going over to the CJC, knowing that the time to, to file the appellate papers might be running because the trial court might have filed a, as you lawyers who know this practice might know, a 1925B order, she was not doing that, which obviously she should have been doing. So that, in combination with the cyber outage, caused her not to file the appellate papers on time. And we did, we did pursue our remedies there as well. In that situation, the trial judge gave the law firm and the defendant a break and permitted the, the late filing of the papers. But for me, Mike, my job is to represent my client. Not our law firm, not the defense firm, not the defendant, our client. I said earlier that my unique political experiences led to where I am today. How, how important to your development as an attorney were your own political experiences? I know how many of the 67 counties you've been to. How many, by the way? All of them. All of them. Um, and, and I, I often will say to, to my own kids, get involved politically at an early age, no matter what the cause or the party, because you'll learn things about people. Yes. How valuable to your life as a trial lawyer have been your political experiences? Yeah, you know, it's, it's so valuable. I, I had a, a student uh, in my torts class uh, uh, last semester who was a brilliant student, but he really couldn't talk in class. He became very, very shy when called upon. And of course, as you'll all remember from towards class, that's done Socratically. And I found a way comfortably to speak to him outside of class. And I said to him, you know, you, you are brilliant, but I see you have some issues with public speaking. And he told me, of course, that he did. And he said, what should I do? And I said, you ought to get involved in politics because there's, this, there's nothing that is a greater preparation for public speaking and practicing law, trying cases and the like than getting involved in a political cause, a campaign for public office or just a cause beyond a campaign. And I said, the, the easiest way to start 
is to get involved with a cause where you have to go door to door. How many of you here have gone door to door for any reason? Any reason? Okay. <laughs> all right. All of you know, okay, all of you know that you will develop real skills by going door to door, right? You knock on the door. So true. The door gets answered. The person is there. They regard you as something between an annoyance and a burglar, right? <laughs> and and you, have to, you have to get the words out of your mouth fairly quickly to establish that you mean no harm, you'll do no harm, you're sane, you're there for a reason, the reason is a good reason, or at least an okay reason, and maybe they might be interested in what it is you have to say and what you have to sell. And I don't know whether it's a fuller brush or it's encyclopedias, of course that doesn't exist anymore, encyclopedias, we all know that, but, but a cause of some kind a cause of some kind is a wonderful way to, to develop these kinds of skills. If you can develop the skills door to door, you can develop the skills to, to talk to a small group. You can develop the skills to talk in class. You can develop the skills to do a mock trial in law school. You can develop the skills to argue a motion in court and to try a case. Probably first non-jury if you're doing uh, work on the criminal side, and, but then jury trials. And of course, if you can, if you can try a, a jury trial, uh, you can be president. Perhaps, regrettably, you can be president without trying a jury trial, but you can certainly, you can certainly be president if you know how to try a case. What, what is the appropriate level of reference to your father in an introduction of Shane Inspector? Uh, I will confess, since this is a, 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 a course on ethics, that, that I think that the answer is uh, uh, that I would be, I would prefer to stand on my own two feet. Uh, I, I could have gone into politics. A lot of children of senators end up in Washington as uh, lobbyists and hangers on, and uh, they try to glom off what their folks have done. <coughs> I've never respected that. Um, I could have gone in some kind of direction such as that. The great thing about being a trial lawyer, among many other things, is that nobody cares who your father is when the jury is deliberating, right? No one cares. No one cares. They might wonder during jury selection, who's the guy named Specter? But that's where it ends. When you're advocating for your client in court, it's all about your client, the other side, the facts, the law, the decision. And uh, that's how I like it. I like to be judged for who I am. I'm very proud of my parents uh, and all the things that they did and all that they instilled in me. But I think my father would be proudest of me if he knew that I wanted to make my own way. He was never one to shy from controversy, but the controversy that surrounded your dad was always issue-oriented. To my recollection, never a personal imbroglio of any kind, which tells me, and he was in the spotlight that entire time. I would always say about your father, you can disagree with his politics, I would say this to radio listeners often, but his, his ethics are beyond reproach. How much moral guidance do you think you received from each of your parents? Tremendous. Tremendous. Uh, and I don't think that's unique to being Jewish, but I think that there are tenets within the Jewish faith uh, that lend themselves particularly well to uh, an excellent upbringing, whether it is emphasis on education or emphasis on personal accountability and responsibility. Uh, it's just part of, of who you are. Uh, my father has been gone for seven years, but I often think to myself uh, about a difficult situation, I would think to myself, uh, what would my father say? Uh, what would my father do? I'm sure each one of you, whether your parents are living or deceased, feel the same way about your parents, don't you? And if that's the way you approach a problem, uh, 
you really can't go wrong, can you? I mean, you, you may make a choice that eventuates in an outcome that's, that's not uh, optimal, but it's not because of a lack of sincerity and a lack of, of trying. Uh, another aspect is the idea of uh, comporting yourself in a way that if, we're, if it's on the front page of the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, it's not going to be a problem. And it's a very good way of looking, especially at, at, your, at your professional life. Anytime you, you send an email or a letter, file a motion, file a lawsuit, answer a lawsuit, it has the potential of being on the front page of the Philadelphia Inquirer. And you have to ask yourself, how do you want to uh, how do you want to regard that in terms of your own professional life? I think also about Frank Rizzo, a name that's familiar to uh, many here, someone who I knew very well and Michael knew much better. Frank Rizzo famously said, never send a letter and never throw a letter away. And he, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't finish high school. Okay, he wasn't a high school graduate or a college graduate or a law school graduate or a practicing lawyer, but he knew enough to know that you can't be guided by emotion. Right? You get angry and you prepare a letter, leave the letter on your desk overnight. The, the next morning, you're not going to want to send it. One of the problems with being in the email age, and I think we all know this, is it gets awfully easy to press that send button. And then we find ourselves regretting that, don't we, sometimes? Uh, and of course, Rizzo knew enough to keep the letters that he was sent that had the, uh, where the sender had the unwisdom of, of, of forwarding that letter. He, he also, Rizzo, believed that the two of them represented the perfect presidential ticket. Why? Uh, that is true. He would say that. I don't know if he really believed it. What was it. the rationale he offered? Uh, he, he and my father had a, a very good relationship when Rizzo was mayor and my father was the DA of Philadelphia. And uh, Mayor Rizzo would say to my father, we should run for president and vice president. There was no question in Rizzo's mind as to who was going to be the, <laughs> the president. And, and Rizzo's articulation was that uh, it was, a, it was a, a great ticket that uh, it was balanced ethnically. Uh, I don't need to explain the reasons why for that. Uh, it was uh, balanced in terms of geography because Rizzo was from South Philadelphia. My father was from East Falls. Uh, That's my favorite part. <laughs> and, and, and the list goes on. I, I don't think it was all that serious. Uh, and of course, uh, Rizzo doubtless knew that the U.S. Constitution prohibits uh, two persons being on the ticket from the same state. Why teach? Why teach? Why teach? Because we have a lot to offer to uh, students. There's a tremendous dearth of practical education in law school. Uh, yes, there are some practitioners who go out and teach specialized courses for upper level students, but there are very few practitioners who are teaching core courses like torts and evidence. And those of us who practice within core disciplines uh, I think that we have something to add to the, to the process. We can also provide real mentoring skills for uh, law students about how to get a good job and how to uh, be professionally satisfied. Regrettably, law schools are focused on turning out lawyers who will pass the bar and who will get a job so their U.S. news ranking will be, uh, if not lower at least where it is, and hopefully higher. Uh, there's no emphasis in law school today at all, anywhere, at seeing to it that lawyers are professionally satisfied. Professionally satisfied. Uh, there is an, there, I, I commend to you an article in the ABA Journal from 2010 called, Are You Happy Now? which is based upon a bunch of survey research, which essentially stands to the proposition that lawyers are needlessly miserable. And they could be a lot happier if they were in environments that, was more, that were more conducive to, to happiness, such as working with people, working in small firms, or for the public interest. Uh, uh, if if, if uh, money were Money is not a driver for, for, for professional satisfaction. I think all of us know that, don't we? That professional satisfaction comes out of human contact 
and doing things that help people. I mean, look, look at what I said to you 20 minutes ago about reforming uh, practices of negligent defendants. That's, that's, that sort of turns me on more than getting a big recovery because uh, we've done okay financially. That's not, that's not a big motivator for me. Uh, improving society is a very, very big motivator. And that article I just referenced talks a lot about that. Law students aren't taught that. But that's something that we practitioners can, can bring to law schools. I'm going to open the floor to questions from the audience after I just pick up on something you just said about your success. How do you, and, and Tom, how do you stay grounded and close to the very lay nature of your client base given the enormity of your success? Um, Jeez, I don't know, Mike. I I look at the practice the same way I did when I when I first walked into the Beasley firm. I mean, people have problems. They have real problems, and our job is to try to solve them to the degree that we can. And that's it. I, I don't need something else to make me happy. I don't need to uh, to. Uh, I don't need to have some, some other validation than knowing that we are doing a good job representing clients and improving their lives and the lives of their neighbors. Uh, that, that's, that to me is very appealing. When you look at the work that we've done in terms of safety measures, I would suggest to you that we have acted as private attorneys general. And I wouldn't put myself in, in the same league with my dad in terms of all he did to help his community and his country, but we've done pretty well. And I think that's something that we all of us can do by way of our work for our clients. We can focus on improving their lives and the lives of others uh, who are in a, in a, in a similar position. Is, is public service out of the question for you at this stage in your life? Well, since I regard myself as a private attorney general, I regard myself <laughs> as engaging in public service every day. And what's the answer to my question? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you said that you were always polite to your guests. <laughs> That's all you wish to say on that? Yes. Okay. Uh, from the audience, who will be the icebreaker? Yes, sir. Or if you have more questions from Michael. No, no, not at I, all. I saw lots of hands from Michael. I, I take no umbrage to questions from Michael. Here's your water. I, I'm good. Thank you for that. Yes, Alan. I, I don't really have anything for Michael at this point. Uh, I know you and certainly uh, Rabbi Becker and uh, attorney Ron Coleman. It's a privilege to have such honored, honored guests here today. And I want to congratulate Rabbi Coleman for putting this together. I think to get this outstanding group, I think it's, it's, it's fantastic. There are, a number of, there are a number of things that I would like to talk to you about. And I think some of it, since we have so many lawyers in here, uh, would be very interesting. But I do have something. One, one comment with uh, Mr. Smirkanich. I think you've indicated, well, you've said, that you, and I think you're a guy that can be trusted. I'd like to see you afterwards or get contact information. I have something very, very good for you. But it has to be off the record. Not my name, not anything else. But I would like to make the contact and see you afterwards. A few things. Uh, one thing a bunch of with uh, what my uh, a colleague uh, Shannon had said and his uh, esteemed partner, Tom Klein, two of the most outstanding attorneys not only in the city but in the state and in the country. Just two of the most outstanding attorneys you ever want to meet. Uh, it's true. Now, Shannon, you said a couple of things. One, I will buttress what you said about J&J, &J, uh, the worst. Uh, 35 years ago, we were handling asbestos cases, again, for tire workers, and we knew that the talc mines were contaminated by the asbestos mines. They've introduced false evidence. They've introduced science uh, uh, scientists who were, who were paid to introduce false evidence. Their law firm did it, and we're, we're dealing with that today. We're dealing with that today, and you're, if you have talc cases, which I know you do, You'll be able to use that information. Something you said, a couple of things where and you are 
an attorney who really, really cares about the people and cares about making changes in society. You really do. You love the law and you want to do things. Now, I've had a, there's a problem that I often get into conflict. And you said, look, I not only want to settle a case, and, and I have to get the best I can for my client. You know, at this stage of the game, I think for you and me and Tom and many others, it's not a question of money for us. It's a question of keeping score and doing something good for society. Now, you represent a client. And we've just had two situations, uh, both of them, I think, both in New York. One was a uh, medical malpractice case, and one of them was a, uh, a products liability case. Uh, we had an offer on the medical malpractice case, I think probably the highest settlement offer in the history of New York just recently. There was one provision, one proviso, confidentiality. <laughs> Have another situation, a product case, okay, a product case uh, here in Philadelphia, Is there I, 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 no, I think it was also New, in our New York office where we were singled out. We had a you know, very good case, and they know that we are going to take the case as far as it goes or do whatever we have to do to find the case. And they settled the case for an enormous amount of money. One proviso. One proviso. We couldn't tell anybody. Now, what do you do? On the one hand, you want to change the procedures of the hospital. You want to get the manufacturer of the automobile or, or whatever it is you, you know, to, to cure that defect. And on the other hand, you've got a client. <laughs> the client wants the money. You know, He's not going to wait 10 years where you've got an enormous amount of money, more money than they can spend in, in a lifetime. What do you do in that balancing? How do you do that? How do you equate that? To do the best you can for your client or to do the best you can for society in general? <laughs> You'll answer it in a minute. Okay. The other thing is, which I have to respectfully disagree with you. A few times I've mentioned your father, and I've given who was a, a, a superstar, a wonderful man, and you know you kind of shy away from it, and you said, "Gee, I don't want to," you know, "I don't want to have." Nah, 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 nah. I don't see why you don't do that. I'd be so proud. Look, I'll, I'll tell you two situations. One situation, I was interviewing an attorney, and. I didn't really know who his father was, and the whole time he kept saying, I'm not my father, I'm not my father, I'm not my father. And afterwards, I found out his father had a bad reputation. I didn't know that. So I've always strived to say, look, uh, I have, as you may know, I think they're putting us in the Guinness Book of Records, the most lawyers in the immediate family. Seven of my, of my kids are with me. Four run the New York office, one Muncie, one later, blah, 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 blah. And I opened doors. They use my name. You know, we spent millions and millions of dollars, as you have, you know, publicizing. Well, one of my sons, who's a, an expert in, in uh, products liability cases, was trying a case against an automobile manufacturer. They're all members of the Pennsylvania, but came down here, walks into the courtroom, and what they do on voir dire, which everybody knows, you know, choosing the the, uh, the jurors, and they said, and there's the defense lawyer, how many know, how many know the uh, uh, such and such defense firm? Raise your hands. No hands went up. And they said, very humbly, how many know Alan Rothenberg? Every hand went up, or a, I'd say 90% of the hands. And they utilize that. They utilize that. I don't know what, if I were you and I would go in, I would make it known right away. You know, you're the, you're the son of the great. And I don't, and I, you know, don't use that term loosely. The great, respected, beloved senator. And that gives you instant credibility because you've got something to be proud of. And I think it's not something, you know, you shouldn't be oversensitive to that, that you want to make it totally on you. I think it's a big help. It's a help to you, to help to your client, and to help to everyone else, and a covet to your, to, to your father. So go back to the question that I had asked. What is the, how do you balance, how do you balance, yeah, how do you balance the interest of your client vis-a-vis -vis society when you know something's really wrong, and they say, look, we're not going to give you the money. Your client's going to have to, we're not, we're, you know, we don't want to, we don't want this publicized. How do you do that? What do you do? The client comes first. Right. All right. That's what we've been forced to do. Yes. Okay. Client comes thank, first. Thank, thank you. you. Um, any questions over here? Thank you for uh, okay. So I, 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 I swear I well, if they want to go for it. Adam, go ahead, Adam. Well, I, I swear this is the first time I've ever done the this is a comment, not a question, but. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, Mike, uh, Mike, earlier you talked about Channel 6 and how you would like it. You, you would hope that they would review ads when they come in before they put them on the air. Actually, as a matter of law, they can't. The FCC equal access rules say that if a candidate pays for an ad, networks have to run it. They have no ability to censor them whatsoever. If it's an independent ad, then you can complain and pull them down, and sometimes you can actually succeed in doing so. 
I think that there's a, an ethical rule of communication, confidential communication to a client. 1.4. <laughs> now, I appreciate you straightening that out. Thank you. Was there someone over here who had a question? What is your feeling about lawyers being able to advertise? Do you think it's beneficial or detrimental? Uh, the question is about lawyer advertising, good or bad. I mean, that ship has sailed. It sailed in 1976 in the Zouder case. The Supreme Court says lawyers have a right to advertise. Uh, that's not going to change. There's not going to be a constitutional amendment. The Supreme Court's not going to go back on that. Uh, do I think society was better off before 1976? Answer, yes. Before? Yes. Yes. I, I think that, uh, yes. I'll leave it at that. Yes. <laughs> But, but, but those of you who, who provide good legal services should not be afraid to advertise because those who provide not good legal services are not afraid to advertise. That's my suggestion. <laughs> I had a question. Hi. So with confidentiality, I've seen over the years instances where the federal judiciary, certain judges won't allow for confidentiality. The federal courts have occasionally uh, not allowed a settlement to be confidential. So what if, number one, it, it becomes codified in some manner or made part of the rules of professional responsibility or in some manner local rule that you can't have confidentiality. Public policy overrides whatever. To Simon, yeah, I, Simon, I think that is a great question. And I have made two suggestions here today for changes to the rules, right? One on judges having to police their courtrooms and two, lawyers having to consider the public interest and representation. And I think a third change that makes sense is on the lines that you said, which is that it is unethical to request that a party undertake confidentiality as part of a lawsuit, and it's unethical for an attorney to agree to confidentiality. Now, in other words, it ought to be unethical for us to be asked to do it, and it ought to be unethical, uh, unethical for us to agree to do it. And, and, and if I may add, Simon, when you are suing a public entity, like the city of Philadelphia. As a matter of law, those settlements are not confidential. We're never asked for confidentiality because there is a right to know under Pennsylvania law. Does that disincentivize settlements? Absolutely not. Lawsuits would still be settled even if confidentiality could not be requested and required. But when I'm put in the position that Alan has described, of course I have to agree because the client comes first. How about in the context of, of the Me Too era? Because this has become part and parcel now of that dialogue, and there's an advocacy movement for not allowing confidential settlements, but oftentimes it, it's the female victim who chooses that confidentiality, and she might be victimized if she can't have that. Well, in many states, she can bring a lawsuit under uh, a pseudonym or under initials so that she's protected regardless. I would have one rule to fit all cases with respect to confidentiality in civil matters. Uh, may, I, may I, with the two minutes we have left, uh, ask Michael a question that I think will be of great interest to the people in this room. Oh boy. And before, we, before we leave. And that, that is, I, I'm not sure if there are, if there are other non-Jews in the room. Uh, um, who might have thought about this. But I think many of us Jews have wondered very much over the years, especially at this time of year, white lights or colored lights? <laughs> and Michael, Michael has written the definitive study of this question. And Michael, if you would share that with us, because I think we all want to know. First of all, as you know, my mother has converted. So I may no longer have credentials to speak to the white lights versus colored lights. But here's what Shannon's referring to. The best radio content that I have delivered over the years has not come from the front pages. Nobody stops and, and says to me, oh, that Obama interview that you conducted, that was excellent, or the night that George W. Bush was elected and he called you on, never. If you remember Seinfeld, Season four, season five, 
Jerry and George are at Monk's Cafe, and they are trying to figure out a television show to pitch to NBC. What was the show going to be about? Nothing. Right. When I speak to nothing, it's my best material. All of those Curb Your Enthusiasm, Larry David moments, I'm constantly looking for content like that that I can deliver. And maybe there was none better than the night that I went on radio here in Philadelphia and extemporaneously said, we just got our Christmas tree and we're going to go home and decorate it. And you know what occurs to me? My wife is going to bathe that tree in white lights. But I am not a white light person. I grew up in a very colored light household. Those big, fat, colored Christmas lights that were part and parcel of the middle class community in which I was raised. But somewhere along the way, the home in which I'm living is larger than the home in which I was raised. The suit on my back cost more money than anything in my father's closet, and the car that I drive nicer than anything he ever commanded. And I guess subliminally along the way, I decided we're now white light people. <laughs> And I maintained that I was going back to the colored lights of my youth. And of course, by the time I got home, my wife had already knocked out the tree in white. That's the way it's been ever since, but I still feel like I'm a colored light person. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Spurkanish and Shane Inspector. That's great. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Now, we, we've heard the topic in the trenches of media and law. And law. Uh, the program will conclude now with Rabbi Brecker sourcing it back to a divine mandate. Thank you very much.